Well, my parents were both born in Syria. My father left before the Ottoman Empire fell. He took his mother and his two sisters. There was a great famine in Syria during World War I. My father was probably here in 1915, 1916. My brother, sister, and I were all born here. My father, uh, he had a little grocery store, as a lot of uh, Arab immigrants did. He was uh, seven years old when his father died, and he was in the streets of Damascus trying to support his mother and his two sisters. So he never got an education, but he opened a little grocery store. And the young men that used to hang out around the store loved him. And he would send them to the library and he'd tell them that he wanted books on certain topics and they would get them. And he ordered a number of world maps, especially the Middle East and Europe, and the way in which the maps uh, change, the borders of countries, break down from empires, the breakdown of the Arab world. He was really just taken with the whole idea of the uh, Arab world, but particularly Palestine. I remember at the age of eight, and that would be 1941, he took me aside one day and he said to me, my daughter, and he said this to me in Arabic. Uh, at that time, I couldn't speak Arabic, but I understood what he was saying. I could understand my parents, but didn't speak it at that time. I speak a little Arabic now. Uh, he would say to me, my daughter, Palestine is going to fall from our hands. And you, in your lifetime, you must never forget Palestine. He said, because Palestine is all of us, and it will, defi it will define our moral integrity. And he said, it's going to be very, very difficult because those that we will be opposed by will have much sympathy in the world. And that was 1941. Uh, and I, uh, I didn't know what that meant at eight years old, but I listened to him. I was the only one who listened to all his lectures as he was talking to his uh, uh, customers. Um, and I, I, all I could say to him, uh, it's okay, Baba. <laughs> My father died young, I was 20 years old, and yet I managed to go to university. We were poor. My mother, who was not always well, her sister, she came to me one day and she said, well, what do you want to study? I said, philosophy. I realized that eventually that it wasn't philosophy that I uh, wanted to major in. It was the questions of philosophy that philosophy couldn't answer, the meaning of life, uh, and so forth. And so I uh, went to sociology, which in the French tradition is a descendant of moral philosophy. I double majored with anthropology and did a lot of political science. Welcome. I'm Jocelyn Ajami, and you're watching The Arabic Hour. Today, we conclude our profile of scholar, intellectual, and activist Dr. Elaine Hagopian. Dr. Elaine C. Hagopian is Professor Emerita of Sociology at Simmons College, Boston. Dr. Hagopian is the principal founder of the Trans-Arab Research Institute, and former president of the Association of Arab American University Graduates, AAUG. And she serves as the chief political interviewer for Arabic Hour Television in Boston. Yeah. 
Hello and welcome to the Arabic Hour. My name is Khenwa Hakim. On today's program, we focus on the crisis in Egypt with our guest, Dr. Hugh Roberts. Thank you, and we are happy today to welcome Hugh Roberts from Tufts. It's good to see you again. We started a conversation some time ago, and I guess it's going to be a continuing conversation. <laughs> Welcome, I'm Jocelyn Ajami, and you're watching The Arabic Hour. Today, we bring you part one of three programs on the topic, Options and Opportunities for Resolving the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict. We're bringing it to you as a panel discussion, moderated by Elaine Hagopian. Elaine, you are very known. You taught at Simmons 30 years. How did you meet with these Arab-American intellectuals living in the United States? I was walking my first day at Smith through the library, and I was thinking that I am working class, and here I am in this very wealthy school. What am I doing here? Then I was walking through, there was this man at the water bubbler, and he looked up, and there were these very blue eyes, and a uh, dark-skinned man, and um, he said to me, you, you, you're the, you're the Syrian girl. And he said, girl, feminism hadn't <laughs> been dominant yet. And um, I looked at him and I said, yes, and I was wondering who he was. He said, come, 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 come with me. There are three of us. I said, three what? He said, three Arabs. And, and he turned out to be Ibrahim al The 67 war occurred. And he called me one day and he said, we're going to form an organization of scholarship people, people who uh, think and understand the Arab world, uh, and I want you to be a part of it. Uh, and that is how I met all these many people, whether it be Hisham Sharabi, Abdin Jabada, Edward Said, uh, Walid Khadadi. At that time, the propaganda coming out of the television sets was so enormous. And uh, the Israelis were sending uh, small groups of their soldiers to re-energize the um, Jewish community uh, here uh, towards Israel. We had a very terrible time. I know I was at Simmons, and um, I would be giving talks, and I would have people write in about me, and uh, the local uh, uh, Zionist groups were uh, attempting to get me fired from my job. There were many threats at that time, and I know one day I came home, I was living in Cambridge, and on my apartment door there was the Star of David, and uh, under it was never again. I had just given a talk. Um, and so it, it was frightening uh, to me. But uh, then I, I thought, you know, uh, I know who I am. Uh, and I understand um, that this is ideological Zionism is not uh, Judaism and it has nothing to do with Jewish life. Uh, it has everything to do with Zionists who want to uh, justify taking this land. What is the difference in structure between a colonial state and a settler colonial state? Yeah, I mean, if we're putting this in the... Um, you know, in the more modern period, the, uh, say from the uh, 18th, 19th, ninth, let's say 19th century on, um, it, it has to be put in the context of imperialism. Uh, and, and it has to also be put in the, in the context of capitalism. <laughs> The point is that we live in a world of nation states that developed in the 19th and 20th century. These nation states, the Western nation states especially, 
do not have all of the uh, resources required for an industrial economy that was developing. And therefore, they had to get it in one of two ways. One, they could try to trade for it, or two, they could capture the land and extract it from the people. The two top imperialist countries were France and the United Kingdom. But, you know, also we remember Germany uh, was involved in Africa and we, uh, and Portugal was involved in Africa and, and so forth. But these were the two main uh, uh, countries. And so they um, sought to, to capture and then um, uh, colonize. Now, when you colonize, you can do it in one of two ways. If you um, simply send an army and you send uh, a bureaucracy, you are basically working on managing the existing population and getting them to do work uh, and extract the resources, whether it be from the ground or um, you know, whether it be minerals, whether it be oil, whether it be gold, whether it be uh, cobalt, whatever they were extracting, and, and do it that way. Or you can basically send settlers. The difference between the settler colonial state of the Israelis and the settler colonial states in other countries, you know, whether it be in uh, South Africa, for example, uh, or even in Algeria, is that the others were not trying to eliminate the uh, indigenous population. They were, they were going there to use them as workers and they may separate them and they may exclude them from living in certain areas, such as in South Africa, they put them on Bantu stands. In Algeria, they had uh, separate quarters. Um, the Zionists uh, went not, to, not necessarily to exploit workers, though eventually they did. They went to actually transform the country from a Palestinian Arab state to a Jewish state with a majority of Jews at a time when Palestine was majority over 90% indigenous Arabs. There were indigenous Jews. They were the original Semitic Jews. And they were uh, considered Palestinians or Iraqis or Syrians or whatever uh, uh, country they were from. Uh, but but they, they were part of that culture of the Middle East. These were European Jews, as you know, who came and settled. And therefore, they were became part of a Western uh, country. Now, they had no mother country. Most colonial settler states have a mother country that supports them. They did not have a mother country. They used the United Kingdom originally, then the United States. Way back in the early days, they imported uh, large numbers of Arab Jews, of Jews from, from Arab countries, Mizrahim, Sephardim, people from places like Iraq, Yemen, Morocco, Syria. Uh, these, these people are ethnically Arab. They were never part of the Zionist original plan for the colonization of Palestine, Israel, which was to be done by Ashkenazi Jews, Jews from Europe. They had no place in their scheme for Arab Jews. These Arab Jews were brought in after the Holocaust because with the Holocaust, with the death of the six million, however many it is, that the Nazis murdered, uh, Israel lost its constituency, lost the population that it was due to have. So they had to fall back on importing non-European Arab Jews to replace Palestinians. The idea ultimately is to replace Palestinians, not to exploit them. They went to get rid of the population. They succeeded, as you know, in the 48 war in getting out 78 and in, in, in getting 78 percent of Palestine, though they wanted all of it. On their map of 1919, it included the Golan Heights of Syria, it included southern Lebanon, 
and it included the parts of the east bank of the Jordan and part of the Sinai. And why this was to uh, this was envisioned in 1919 as uh, having sufficient water to attract immigrants to live a European style of life and to build an industrial complex. You have to have enough water. And if you go back and read Ben Gurion very carefully. He says in one letter, uh, they were criticizing him for accepting, you know, the partition plan and, and whatnot as a tactical move. He accepted it as a tactical, not as the final move. That Zionism will occur in two stages. That the first stage is to establish the state and to have it recognized. And then the second state will be the expansion. The 67 war was the expansion into those areas. They annexed, of course, the Golan Heights in 1981, which is where the richest water sources are. Israel is the last of the major colonial experiences. All along, the idea of making a Jewish state has been an exclusive idea. A Jewish state hasn't been a state that can be a haven for Jews, along with other people. A Jewish state has always been imagined as a state for only Jews. Uh, they even go so far as sometimes as to call it a, a, a Jewish democracy, which is, of course, a contradiction in terms. Imagine a white people's democracy, or a men's democracy, or any other kind of ethnically specific democracy. It doesn't work. Democracy is universal, Jewish is particular. The idea of a Jewish democracy is a contradiction in terms. But that's what they have always been after, is an exclusively Jewish state. Now, you can't imagine an exclusively Jewish or anything else, Catholic or African or whatever state, in somebody else's country without having to dream of getting rid of those people in order to achieve it. And that has always been there in the logic of Zionism, and it has surfaced recurrently. There's never been a moment when somebody within the Zionist hierarchy has not been talking about the desirability of moving the Palestinians out and, and depositing them in Arab countries, which are seen as undifferentiatedly just Arabs, they must have moved the Palestinians out, they're just Arabs like all the others, we can get rid of them and lose them in the Arab mass. That ideal has been there all along. Uh, whether or not you can achieve it, it is of course an entirely different matter and it does seem to me that in the present world it is not viable for Israel to contemplate the sort of behaviour. They got away with it in 1948 with the Nakba when they drove between seven and 800,000 Palestinians were driven out of their homes. Moreover, worse than that, then uh, procedures were set in place to prevent them coming back. Jewish villages were built in the place of Arab villages. You do not even know the names of these villages, and I do not blame you, because geography books no longer exist 
Not only the books do not exist, the Arab villages are not there either. There is not one single place built in this country that did not have a former Arab population. Many noted uh, Israeli uh, readers have called Palestinians cockroaches, that these people are nothing and they're a nuisance. And this brilliant concept that Edward Said developed is very important. Today's Orientalism, and a very good article by Adam Schatz on this, uh, is different. And it's different uh, and it's more racist and more ugly because it is now done by people like Trump and by social media uh, in which you, you don't even have the intellectual writing about these people, but you have people who know nothing about them tweeting that these are uh, terrorists, um, murderers, um, rapists, uh, this and that. And so it doesn't even have uh, what Edward used to call, um, you know, sort of power, uh, manacled thinking. It's not simply that your thinking is, is chained and uncontrolled, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't vicious the way today's hatred of Muslims and Arabs are. Well, my interest in Orientalism began for two reasons. One was an immediate thing, that is to say, the Arab-Israeli War of 1973, which had been preceded by a lot of images and discussions in the media and the popular press, you know, about how the Arabs are cowardly and they don't know how to fight and they're, you know, always going to be beaten because they're not modern. And then everybody was very surprised when the Egyptian army crossed the canal in early October of 1973 and demonstrated that, you know, like anybody else, they could fight. And the second one, which is a, has a much longer history in my own life, was, was the constant um, sort of disparity I felt between what my experience of being an Arab was and the representations of that that one saw in art. And, you know, the fact that those representations of the Orient had very little to do with what I knew about my own background in life. So I decided to write the history of that. If somebody, let's say, in the 1850s or 60s in Paris or London wished to talk about or read about India or Egypt or Syria, there would be very little chance for that person to simply um, address the subject, uh, as we like to think, in a kind of free and creative way. A great deal of writing had gone before. And this writing was an organized form of writing, like an organized science, you know, what, what I've called Orientalism. And it seemed to me that uh, there was a kind of repertory of images that kept coming up. And the more I looked, the more I saw that you didn't get what you could call realistic representations of the Orient. And this extended even further into descriptions of the Arabs by experts, you know, people who had uh, studied them. And I, I noticed that even in the 20th century, some of the same images that you found in the ni 19th century, and then you read somebody in, in the 1920s, and they're more or less saying the same thing. April the 16th, 1979. In an angry, provocative new book called Orientalism, Edward Said, professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University, argues that the West has tended to define Islam in terms of the alien categories imposed on it by Orientalist scholars. He summarized the thesis of Orientalism in this article for Time. One of the strangest, least examined and most persistent of human habits is the absolute division between East and West, Orient and Occident. Almost entirely Western in the origin, this imaginative geography that splits the world into unequal, fundamentally opposite spheres, has brought forth more myths, more detailed ignorance, and more ambitions than any other perception of difference. The differences between different kinds of Orientalisms are, in effect, the differences between different experiences of what is called the Orient. I mean, the difference between 
Britain and France on the one hand and the United States on the other, is that Britain and France had colonies in the Orient. I mean, they had a long-standing uh, relationship and imperial uh, role in a place like India. And the same with the French in North Africa, let's say Algeria or Indochina, uh, direct colonial experience. In the case of the Americans, the experience is much less direct. I mean, there's never been an American occupation of the Near East. The second big thing, I think that differs in the American experience from the British and the French of Orientalism, is that American Orientalism is very politicized by the presence of Israel, for which America is the main ally. And what you have, in effect, is the creation of a Jewish state in the middle of the Islamic Oriental world. And the sense that because it's, an, it's a Jewish state and a Western state, self-declared, there is a greater coincidence between American interests there. I think the presence of, of this other factor, which is very anti-Islamic, where Israel regards the whole Arab world as its enemy, is imported into, into American Orientalism. It's a tragedy, virtually impossible for an American to see on television, to read books, to see films about the Middle East that are not colored politically by this, by this conflict in which the Arabs are almost always play the role of terrorists and violent uh, people and irrational and so on and so forth. The only thing they understand is the language of force. This is, this is the principle here, that unless you give them a bloody nose, they won't understand. We can't talk reason with them. Israel has always been the exceptional country. That is, no matter how many Palestinians it kills, uh, no matter how much land it takes, no matter how many countries land it annexes, it is never uh, thought of in terms of being a rogue country, and it is a rogue country. I mean, even with the former Secretary of State John Kerry saying you're going to become an apartheid state, for which he was condemned by so many and he was quickly shut up, he said, he said to Israel, if you, if you keep this way, you're going to be an apartheid state. One American said this, John Kerry, he was immediately shut up. Because Israel is the exception. It always uh, goes back to the Holocaust. There is an empirical reality of the Jewish life. They did have a Holocaust. Okay, but there were many other genocides. It was an Armenian genocide nobody ever speaks about. Um, but they, they have effectively put this forth. There are living images that are always uh, put across. There are museums uh, all over the place. Uh, the Holocaust is uh, something that was horrible that happened and that everybody condemned it. But of the Zionists, find it very useful in order to legitimize Israel. Second, you have the rise of the religious right. And uh, both in Israel, where they say God gave them the land, and the evangelicals here, and evangelicals that were in the United Kingdom who actually wanted to see a Jewish state in order to get rid of Jews and to bring about uh, uh, the, the end times. At a certain point, the uh, British officialdom began also to think in terms of uh, having a Jewish state that would be a client state in their own imperial thrust into the Middle East. And so they tended to favor it. It was very clear that the British wanted to give somebody else's land to a uh, foreign ideological group because it seemed at that time to serve British uh, interests. So the British gave to the Zionist Palestine, even though Palestine was under a League of Nations mandate, the British had put in the mandate the, uh, the promise to the Zionists but at the same time, in Article 11, I believe, of the mandate, it called for 
the British to prepare the uh, existing uh, population for uh, nationhood, for statehood. They just gave the land away, even though the majority of the population were the indigenous Palestinian people. The interplay between British domestic and imperial considerations, Jewish Zionist lobbyists and Christian Zionist prophetic politics would lead to the Balfour Declaration which promised a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Then an imperial world power, Britain, gave sanction for the first time to the Zionist campaign for possession of Palestine. Professor Chomsky, I would like to start with a word of Edward Said talking about you in 1975 in the Palestinian Review. He says, There are men whose humanity is armed with learning, with an indefatigable energy for seeking out uncomfortable truths and little known because deliberately buried facts. So I wanted to start with this uh, saying of Edward Said, whom you know very well. Yes, we were a mutual admiration society. Yes. In the text of your lecture given at Columbia at the memorial of Edward Said, December 2009, you say, I think the greatest singular achievement of Said as literary critic has been to put imperialism at the center of Western civilization. There is an almost remarkable tendency to not mention imperialism as shaping the contours of Western civilization. In literary criticism and historical writing, there are two times, before Orientalism and after Orientalism. And my question is, in the light of Orientalism, can you explain what is imperialism? There are many uh, efforts to uh, define the term. Uh, I think we all know pretty much what it means. It means the exerting of the power of one state over uh, the people and society of others. It can take many forms, uh, direct contact, uh, direct conquest, uh, harsh sanctions, uh, current U.S. mode of imperialism. Uh, in the case in question, there has been a basically a thousand-year war of the North against the global South, um, borrowing the phrase of the eminent uh, historian of the Middle East, Will, William Polk. Uh, and as he points out, the war against the global south is mostly the war against the Muslim south. Uh, this war has taken many forms. The, the, global so the Muslim south has sought many ways to resist, uh, accommodation, uh, uh, imitation, direct exist uh, resistance, uh, conciliation. Uh, nothing has worked. Uh, the final stage, uh, the current stage, is a uh, a kind of jihadism. In fact, Polk's uh, great work on the subject is called uh, Crusaders and Jihadis. 
uh, reviewing this long history. Uh, but uh, we've now, uh, just about every imaginable form has been used, uh, direct aggression, occupation over and over. Uh, just uh, uh, yesterday, we uh, heard a new stage in the uh, direct support for direct aggression and occupation. Uh, the U US government's announcement that it now will violate the judgment of the International Court of Justice, which declared all settlements, all Israeli settlements in the occupied territories to be illegal. Uh, even the U.S. Justice, Justice Bergenthal, uh, uh, gave his accord to this in a separate uh, statement. Yesterday, uh, the Secretary of State declared that uh, the United States no longer abides by that. So the, here's a case of aggression and occupation, which is officially recognized by the United States instead of merely supporting it as it's been doing all along and blocking efforts to uh, negotiate a settlement. So aggression and violation are one form of imperialism. Brutal sanctions are another form. There's only one country in the world that is powerful enough to impose sanctions which it does freely, that's the United States. Sanctions issued by the United States, in fact, are apply not just to the state that's sanctioned, but to every other country. So when the U.S. declares sanctions against Iran in order to try to destroy its economy, uh, undermine its regime, uh, European countries don't agree, but they have no choice but to uh, accept uh, U.S. orders. Uh, the U.S. essentially runs the international financial system and countries that disobey the orders of the Godfather will be duly punished. Then we can say that imperialism is always a domination on other people, other countries. That's the way we use the term. So it takes the history of the United States, which is a striking case. The United States, uh, the founding fathers, uh, described their uh, goals of uh, taking over control of th what's now the national territory, in fact, the entire continent, as a form of imperialism. They didn't refrain from using the term. There are other forms of imperialism, the British Empire, the French Empire, uh, the Spanish Empire. Uh, 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 Hitler's conquests were a form of imperialism. The Russian Empire was another one. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, it all involves one or another form of domination, uh, sometimes combined with uh, 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 much harsher crimes, even total, uh, aims at total extermination. You say, and I quote you, settler colonialism, commonly the most vicious form of imperial conquest. Can you give me an explanation of your saying, especially in the context of Palestine-Israel? Settler colonialism is indeed a uh, quite an extreme form of imperial domination. Settler colonialism not only dominates the uh, nations that are uh, conquered and repressed, but it actually uh, replaces their population. It involves ethnic cleansing, extermination, uh, replacement of the populations by uh, the new settlers who come in and essentially take over. So. Uh, the United States is a extreme case of settler colonialism. Of course, there were many millions of uh, native people here who were driven out, uh, exterminated. Uh, the new colonists took over their lands. Another case is uh, Israel's uh, entire existence. It was a form of settler colonialism. It uh, uh, essentially re the initial Zionist, uh, some call it invasion, whatever term you want to use, the emigration to the former Palestine, 
there were, I think, possibilities for accommodation and integration, but they didn't last very long. But uh, the formation of Israel in 1948, the conquests that took place that year, left uh, Jewish domination of uh, most of the country, about half the country, uh, the other half was taken over by Jordan in a tacit agreement with the Zionist movement. Uh, the Palestinian population was mostly expelled, many killed, some remained in the West Bank, in the Jordanian area, a few in the Jewish area. Then in 1967, uh, the, the outcome of the war was that uh, Israel took over uh, new territories, new Palestinian territories, uh, the West Bank, uh, the uh, Gaza Strip, uh, and has since been uh, carrying out uh, extensive further settler colonialism, uh, establishing extens an extensive settlement structure. In the West Bank, Israel has moved in hundreds of thousands of settlers. Uh, it's expanded what used to be Jerusalem to about five times its size, taking in uh, Palestinian villages. Uh, policy has been pretty clear since about 1970, but to try to establish a, what will be a greater Israel with the settled areas integrated into Israel by vast uh, infrastructure projects. The remaining Palestinian population is uh, segregated into uh, on small enclaves. There's uh, almost probably 160, 170 of them now. But uh, the Israel Israeli settler colonial project is a striking case uh, now, uh, again, underway before our eyes. Professor Chomsky, I heard you on Democracy Now! and I want to ask you about the role of Great Britain in the implementation of the Zionist project in historical Palestine. Well, after the First World War, the former Ottoman Empire, which included Palestine, was essentially taken over by Britain and France, and they carved it up in a secret agreement, Sykes-Picot agreement, uh, uh, for their own interests, not taking, not giving any attention and concern to the interests of the local population. That was irrelevant. Uh, uh, France took uh, Lebanon and Syria. Britain took uh, what's now Palestine and Iraq and uh, created what were called mandates under the League of Nations. Uh, which in theory were supposed to leave to lead to independence and uh, some at least some uh, uh, some degree of local sovereignty, but in practice uh, meant uh, developed in accord with the interests of the dominant powers. Britain uh, authorized the uh, establishment of uh, what was called a Jewish national home. There was some wording about uh, preserving the rights of the uh, native population, indigenous population, but uh, that had the usual meaning in imperial history. In fact, Lord Balfour himself, uh, author of the Balfour Declaration, uh, separately stated that the interests of uh, the indigenous population uh, really didn't amount to much. British, uh, it was a very, it was somewhat varied, but effectively it supported the the, Jew, the Zionist immigration project. Uh, the 19th, mid 1930s, there was an Arab uprising uh, protesting the British government control and policies and the Zionist immigration. The British uh, put it down, uh, put down the revolt very uh, brutally, uh, laid the basis for. Uh, 
the Israeli conquest that took place in 1948. Uh, so the British rule was, you know, there are more ugly cases in history, but it was pretty unpleasant, to put it pretty mildly, and quite supportive of the basic Zionist uh, immigration project. Uh, incidentally, it's not that the opinions of the population were unknown. They were quite well known. Woodrow Wilson, the U.S. president, sent a commission, the King Crane Commission, to do a careful study of the attitudes and opinions of the local population. And not surprisingly, they were overwhelmingly opposed to the European immigration, the Jewish immigration. Their concerns are reported in a detailed study, but uh, no one paid any attention to them. What are the reasons, Professor Chomsky, for Europe and USA to back up Israel? It's kind of a mixed story. Take the U.S., uh, which is the strongest supporter. U.S. government attitudes towards Israel were kind of sympathetic, but not overly supportive uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. In fact, in 1956, uh, when Israel uh, jointly with Britain and France, uh, invaded uh, Egypt. Israel took over the Sinai. They tried to overthrow Nasser. Uh, President Eisenhower simply ordered them out. After 1967, the war in which uh, uh, the major 1967 war, uh, U.S. relations with Israel changed dramatically. Uh, at that point, Israel became a highly favored client state. Uh, there's a reason uh, Israel had performed a major service to the United States and to its Saudi Arabian ally in 1967. Uh, there was a conflict going on, actually a, a literal war going on, between Saudi Arabia and Egypt, representing two different varieties of uh, uh, the Islamic world. Uh, Egypt was the center of a kind of secular nationalism. Uh, Saudi Arabia was, of course, the center of uh, radical Islamism. Uh, the United States, very much like Britain before it, uh, tended strongly to support radical Islam in opposition to secular nationalism, which was considered much more dangerous. Uh, Israel uh, destroyed the centers of secular nationalism uh, major gift to the United States that firmed up the relationship between the United States and Israel. Uh, all the way back, back to 1948, the, uh, the U.S. military, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, had uh, been impressed with Israel's military prowess and considered it to be a potential uh, military ally of the United States in the region. That increased through the years, and uh, Israel became recognized to be a strategic asset, as it's called, the base for American power. Why Israel persist in this 21st century to continue its politics of colonization and its politics of destruction. It's continuing because it can easily get away with it. It's uh, like asking why any other power tries to extend its power and wealth. Uh, they can do it because the United States provides strong support. Uh, Europe provides tacit support. Uh, the Trump administration is, of course, extreme in this case. And as long as uh, that continues, it's hard to imagine that Israel won't uh, continue to try to maximize its power and wealth as long as it's authorized to do so. Uh, they'll, like any other power, they'll find all kind of pretexts to justify it. That's normal. Uh, but the basic facts are pretty simple. 